Hi ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another IB economics video. In this video we're going to be talking about the concept of price elasticity of supply. Now price elasticity of supply is extremely similar to the concept of price elasticity of demand. Now we did a three-part series on price elasticity of demand on this YouTube channel. So if you are struggling a bit, if you just want some background before going into PES, before going into price elasticity of supply, then have a look at those videos. They'll give you a great foundation because a lot of the concepts, a lot of the maths is transferable to PES. Okay, But let's get into talking about what price elasticity of supply or PES is actually all about. You might remember from our PED explanation what elasticity means, what the concept of elasticity is in economics. Now, elasticity is a very specific concept in the, the world of economics. Elasticity actually means we're measuring the responsiveness of one variable to another variable. Now, what do I mean by responsiveness? It's essentially measuring how much does something change by when we make some other change. Now that might sound a tiny bit confusing, but let's let's bring up the definition for price elasticity of demand here, uh, price elasticity of supply, sorry, um, and you'll see exactly what I mean. Okay, PES or price elasticity of supply measures the responsiveness of quantity supplied. So how much does quantity supply change by of a good to changes in its price? So we're essentially saying. Suppose there is a good. Let's take an example. Let's let's suppose we're looking at watches, okay? And the price of watches change, either up or down. What PES measures is how much does the quantity supply change as a result of this price. So imagine you're a producer, imagine you're a supplier, and suddenly you see, hey, the price of watches has gone up. Price of watches is higher. You can sell the watches for a higher price. Well, naturally, the law of supply tells us that as a supplier, we're going to try to supply more watches now. Because we can sell them for a higher price, I'm going to try to sell more of them, right? But what PES measures is exactly by how much does my quantity supply change, okay? Am I going to double my quantity supplied? Am I going to triple it? Well, what exactly is going to happen to my quantity supplied, okay? You can see next to the definition there, we've got a quick formula. Now, this formula is going to look extremely familiar to you if you watch those PED videos, okay? Because this formula is almost the exact same. Now, we say PES is equal to the percentage change in quantity supplied, as you can see there, percentage change represented by that triangle in quantity supplied, divided by the percentage change in price. Now, if you're unfamiliar with exactly how to do this calculation, go back to those PED videos. In the second video, we talk you through exactly how to do calculations when you're looking at the percentage change of something. Okay, the specific formula we're going to use, but that's exactly transferable over to PES. So I'm not going to repeat those calculations in this video. But make sure to go back to that video if you have any questions. Now, note as well, it would only be HL students that would be required to do this kind of math, right? Um, mathematics in economics is only really part of the HL syllabus. That being said, SL students do need to know this formula anyway. So, for example, if you're asked to define what PES is, as a standard level student, you would be required to both say, PES measures the responsiveness of quantity supplied of a good to changes in its price, as well as stating that formula. You'll never need to use the formula to do any real calculations, but you do need to be aware that it exists. Okay, so this is essentially summarizing the definition of PES, of price elasticity of supply, looking at how responsiveness the quantity supplied is when the price of a good changes. Let's get into a tiny bit more about how this actually is used in practice. Okay, We say that PES shares the same properties as PED in terms of elasticity. Once again, we see the similarity, PES and PED. We talked about how elasticities can be elastic, they can be inelastic, they can be somewhere in between. Well, this bullet point kind of summarizes all the potential numbers for the PES, okay? We say, first of all, that if PES is less than one, it is inelastic, okay? Let's have a look at how that might look on an actual graph. What would an inelastic PES curve look like? Let's set up uh, some axes here. 
and we'll draw an inelastic, an inelastic supply curve. Okay, what exactly is that going to look like? Well, inelastic, just from the word, we can hear that that's not going to move very easily. Something that's inelastic, it's, it's resistant to change, it's resistant to movement. Okay, essentially what that means in terms of PES is that even when the price changes, suppliers are going to be resistant to change their quantity supplied. Essentially saying, no matter what the price is, the quantity supplied will be kind of the same. All right, how might that look in a curve? Well, let's put price up here um, and let's put quantity down here. We've got to always label our axes, right? Once we've got that set up, what would a supply curve look like that stays at the same quantity no matter what the, the, the price is? Well, the curve is going to look something like this, okay? An extremely steep su supply curve. Okay? What is that essentially applying? implying, I should say, it means that no matter what the price ends up being, the quantity stays relatively similar, okay? So an inelastic curve will look quite steep. An inelastic curve will look quite steep, okay? So that's the first one. Let's have a look at what, um, for example, a, a an elastic supply curve will look like. So if the PES is greater than one, the second one that we've written up on there, okay? Let's have a look at a set of axes again. So an elastic supply curve will essentially be the opposite, right? We're looking at a curve um, that is extremely responsive to change, okay? So the price changes and the quantity changes by massive amounts, okay? So let's have a look at what that might look like. Well, a supply curve that's extremely elastic is gonna be extremely flat, something like this, okay? So the price changes by even the tiniest bit and supply goes shooting off, okay? We'll talk about what, what could be the examples for that scenario in just a second. But this would be an elastic supply curve, okay? So that's our, our, our second one. Right. Um, then we've got PES being equal to zero. P PES being equal to zero, right? And we say that that would be perfectly inelastic. Now, perfectly inelastic just means that it's a vertical curve, right? It essentially means that no matter what the price is, the supply is going to be the exact same. So I'm not even going to draw that. Okay. And then we've got PES equal to infinity means perfectly elastic, perfectly horizontal. Okay. So as PES go, oh, goes shooting upwards, um, this supply curve is going to become more and more flat. All right. And then the last one we've got PES being equal to one is unit elastic. Okay, which is essentially it's not elastic, it's not inelastic. We say that it that's a basically um, a straight downward sloping curve. Okay, now the reason I'm I'm kind of skipping through these is because hey, all of you who watch that PED video, you'll see that these concepts are directly transferable. They're the exact same. I wanted to show you what a an inelastic supply curve looked like and what a, um, an elastic supply curve looked like, but otherwise these calculations, these numbers, they're all the exact same as PED. Okay. I want to get to the last topic about PES, which is the main difference between PES and PED, okay? And what that is, is what we call the determinants of these, okay? The determinants of PES, essentially saying, what is it that decides if we have a um, specifically elastic or specifically inelastic supply curve, okay? So factors that determine the elasticity of supply. If you understand these factors, you'll essentially be able to look at any good, look at any product and say, hey, I probably anticipate this to have quite an elastic or quite an inelastic supply. Now, let's have a look at these four factors. Okay, The first factor is going to be what we call mobility of factors of production or the adaptability of factors of production. Now, let's have an example. Let's, let's think of an example in this scenario. Okay. So suppose you have a uh, factory with factors of production. So let's, let's, let's think they have some machines, for example, to produce whatever good that they're producing. But these machines allow them to produce a wide range of goods. For example, they have some machines that produce t-shirts. But one day t-shirts go out of fashion and instead everyone wants sweaters. 
Well, if you have machines that can easily transfer from producing t-shirts to producing sweaters, then you have very adaptable resources, right? You didn't need to buy a bunch of extra machines, buy a bunch of extra capital in order to make this switch. You could just one day decide, hey, I'm going to start producing sweaters instead. Now, if you have adaptable resources or, or highly mobile factors of production, what does that mean to your elasticity of supply? Well, that implies that you can very easily get in and out of the market. So suppose one day the price of t-shirts falls massively, okay? No one wants to buy t-shirts anymore, so, so they're completely out of fashion, okay? What you can do is from one day to the next completely stop producing t-shirts and start producing sweaters instead. What does that imply for your elasticity of supply? Well, if we draw a little curve here, you'll be able to see, um, oh, sorry about that. Um, you'll be able to see that the curve that we end up with is going to end up being extremely flat. Why is this? Because you can change the quantity extremely easily. Okay, so we say the more adaptable, the mo more mobile your factors of production are, the um, more elastic your supply curve is going to be. Okay, so that's number one. Now let's get to that number two, which you'll have already spotted, which is unused capacity. This follows a similar vein, right? If you have a factory, and in this factory you have tons of space that's not being used, or you have tons of workers that aren't being employed to their, their full um, capability, what you can do is quite easily expand your production of something into this unused capacity. Okay, so if you as a business, as a factory, have a bunch of unused capacity, you can, from one day to the next, dramatically increase your quantity of supply. Now, what does that once again imply? It implies that you have a very elastic supply curve because you can change your quantity supplied extremely easily. Okay, so more adaptable resources and unused capacity will both lead to higher elasticity of um, your supply curve, okay? So that's the second one that we look at. The third one that we look at is your ability to store stocks or how durable your good is. Let's take tomatoes, for example. Tomatoes are an example of a type of good that will go bad in just a couple of days. So suppo suppose you're a tomato farmer and you've got all these tomatoes stacked up and you go down to the market and you try to sell all these tomatoes and you see that, hey, today, the price for tomatoes was extremely low. Essentially, maybe there wasn't much demand for it, maybe there were tons of other sellers, who knows what was going on. But the price of tomatoes was extremely low. Do you think that you have the ability, as a farmer, to say, hey, today I'm not going to sell my tomatoes, I'll wait until tomorrow instead? You can't really do that. <clears throat> Why is that? Because your tomatoes are going to go bad by tomorrow, okay? You have to sell them today. No matter what the price is, you basically have this quantity of tomatoes and you have to sell them today because otherwise they'll go bad, okay? So what we're implying is that if you can't store your stocks, if you have a, a, an extremely non-durable good like tomatoes, like most type of food, then you're going to have inelastic supply, steep supply curve. Why? Because no matter what the price is, you're going to have to sell this quantity today. You don't have the option of waiting till tomorrow, waiting till next week and selling more tomatoes then because all your tomatoes will have gone rotten. Okay, so we say the more that you can store your stocks, the higher ability you have to store stocks, the more elastic your curve is going to be. If you can't store stocks, if you have a non-durable good like tomatoes, you're going to have an extremely inelastic supply curve. So that's our number three, okay? Then we'll have a look at the fourth determinant, um, which is time, okay? Essentially what we say is, um, let's suppose as a farmer, um, you are creating tomatoes, you're, you're cultivating tomatoes, you're growing these, but hey, some study comes out that says tomatoes are terrible for the world. Um, tomatoes are terrible for human beings, we should stop eating them. You don't really have the ability from one day to the next to completely stop growing tomatoes because you planted all these seeds, they have, you know, they have to grow up, etc. You can't just start producing potatoes the following day. You would have to root up your entire farm, plant new seeds, wait for them to grow, etc. 
Okay, so in a short time span over the course of a day or so, you don't have the ability as a supplier to change your quantity supplied by that much because hey, you're you're you've already planted these tomatoes, etc. Okay, so you have a very inelastic supply in a short time frame. Whereas when you expand this time frame over months or years and so on, as a supplier, you're going to have much more elastic supply because you're going to have the options of reducing your supply of one good, increasing your supply of another, and so on. Okay, So for example, over the course of a couple of years, if there's some other grain or some other vegetable, some other fruit that becomes way hotter on the market, you have the ability to reduce your production of tomatoes and increase your production of that other vegetable. Okay, That's why we say that time will lead to a more elastic supply curve. You have the option to change your quantity supply way easier. Okay. That's essentially price elasticity of supply summarized. You can see a lot of the concepts are transferable from PED. Of course, we didn't go through the mathematics of PES in this video, but that's because the math is the exact same as it looked like in PED. So if you're struggling, go back to that second PED video. The one thing to be able to note about PES is understanding the definition of it and recalling that definition. And second of all, knowing these four determinants or these four factors. If you can know these, if you can understand these and then be able to apply them. So when I give you an example of some kind of good, like tomatoes, will you be able to say with some confidence, is the supply going to be inelastic or is it going to be elastic? Now, remember tomatoes, of course, inelastic supply because it's a non-durable good and we're looking at pretty short time frame okay so try to keep this in mind as we're talking about PES in this next video we're going to be talking about some other elasticities as well we'll talk about YED and after that we'll talk about XED so tune back for those and you'll see there's some similarities between them as well okay until the next one